and I will turn it over to John. John, thank you so much for coming. And we are excited to learn about Julia Butler Hansen tonight. Vicki, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for, for joining us for this program tonight in this strange new world of virtual realities. I got to thinking about um, all the amazing people I've met in the past 55 years as a writer, uh, among them Pete Seeger, Harry Bridges, the old ILWU longshore leader, John Wayne, Kurt Cobain, Slade Gorton. How's that? Would that make a great dinner party with Pete Seeger, Harry Bridges, John Wayne, Kurt Cobain, and Slade Gorton? But Julia is just such a, an inimitable person, such a force of nature. Um, here, I need, think I need to click here a minute, Vicki, to make certain that I'm continuing on this recording there. Now I can see my screen again. The uh, I can conjure up Julia's nicotine stained voice telephoning me from Washington DC uh, at the drop of a hat. When I first met her, I was a college student uh, and she was a newly elected member of Congress. Uh, our first meeting, she arrived early for a, a student forum at Grace Harbor College. And my mom told me that I should always be early so I'd never be late. So I was there as a student reporter and Julia walked in, uh, plopped down next to me and immediately bummed a cigarette. Uh, I offered her a light from my Zippo lighter and I was 17 years old and started smoking to try to look older myself. Silly us back then. And Julie and I smoked and chatted for about 30 minutes before the, the forum. And I was just absolutely entranced by what a fascinating down to earth and yet so articulate person she was. And then if you fast forward to 1966, when I got my first full-time job in journalism as a political reporter for the Aberdeen Daily World, Julia was on the threshold of becoming the most powerful woman in Congress. Um, so three years ago, when our oral history team began planning for the 2020 centennial of the 19th Amendment, I, I said, it's time now to write Julia's biography. It's been percolating in my brain for too long. And although Julia died in 1988, and unfortunately a lot of people have forgotten who she was, I think her legacy as an equal rights pioneer is, is more relevant than ever before. Uh, it, this really snapped into focus when we read a study by the conducted by the now I'm getting a little, I'm getting pop-ups here. Isn't this a brave new world? <laughs> a study conducted by the National Women's History Museum in 2019 revealed that successful trailblazing women uh, in all professions were dramatically underrepresented in K through 12 social studies curricula. So we set out to do something about that with a book that, that appeared just before Julia called Ahead of the Curve. And it spotlighted on uh, suffrage pioneers in Washington State, and then latter day their latter day counterparts like um, Chris Gregoire, Anna Maria Casse of the University of Washington, Stephanie Kuntz, um, the the noted sociologist. But one thing led to another. Um, the pandemic erupted in the middle of all this, and frankly, it gave uh, Aaron and I and my other teammate, Bob Young, uh, more time to hunker down and uh, just be cloistered and work. So the Julia biography got done in record time, um, thanks in no small part to her son, David Hansen, who is a retired Fort Vancouver curator, um, a university trained historian. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But um, about Julia, she grew up in a small town along the Columbia River. These are wonderful photos too. This really makes the book come alive. Uh, when we do books, we don't just do the, uh, frankly, what I think is sadly boring by putting a clump of small pictures in the middle of a little glossy section in the middle of a book. The, thanks to the, the, the terrific designers that I get to work with, in this case, Amber Rainey of our staff, these photographs are interspersed chronologically throughout the book. And here's Julia looking darling in her, her hat with her brothers, Donald and James, uh, 
uh, in, in Calf Lambert, tiny Calf Lambert in Wakayakum County, about 1914, I would guess, Julia having been born in, in 1907. The, um, she grew up, if you've been to Calf Lambert, if you haven't been to Calf Lambert, I should say, and if you haven't, if you've been there but haven't been there lately, it is the great way to have a, uh, a soul reviving road trip. Because if you, whether you come down uh, along the Long Beach side, down through Nacelle and Skamakaway, and these wonderful places where you can almost feel the pioneer pixie dust, dust when you arrive in Calf Lambert, especially on a, a drizzly day, it's like it's like being there's Brigadoon emerging from the mist. It's just this amazing place. There's the historic Hanson home where where Julia grew up. At one end of Main Street and the other end of Main Street, there's the Dumont Brothers Dry Goods and Grocery Store, and it's been like that since the turn of the century. Well, how did Julia Butler Hanson become? From a, to come from a town of barely 500 people. And I, I tried to, to, to pin this down, but I don't think that, that anyone in, in the modern era has been elected to Congress from a town as small as Calf Lamb at Washington. There were about 500 people when she was growing up and there's about 500 people there now. The, uh, between 1938 and 1974, Julia Butler Hansen won 42 consecutive elections. Scoop Jackson and Warren Magnuson are two U.S. senators uh, she had met when they were all young Democrats together in the New Deal era. And they were she was always giving them a bad time that they when they were in the Senate, they got to be elected for six years and she had to run every two years. By the way, um, between 1960 and 1974, her average victory margin in being reelected to Congress was 62.8 percent. And that included carrying places like Lewis County, uh, which are uh, to put to say that they're staunchly Republican is putting it mildly. Someone once quipped that, that, that Lewis County was the headquarters of the fallout shelter industry. But nevertheless, the Republicans in Lewis County liked Julia Butler Hansen. That's because she delivered and she did her homework. She was also refreshingly, and this is what we've been through, she was one of the most bipartisan people in, in Congress. Here's, a, here's one of Julia's triumphs. Uh, after being elected to the Washington legislature in 1938, in her first year, and this is Julia right, be, right behind Governor Clarence Martin, um, together with this bipartisan group of Republican and Democrat women, uh, there's uh, Secretary of State Bell Reeves, um, Pearl Wanamaker, who went on to be uh, superintendent of public construction. And uh, Julia pushed through this act that said, that's still in force today, that says that the chairman and the vice chairman of each political party's state central committees or county or state central committees has to be, uh, if there's a male chairman, then the vice chairman has to be female and vice versa. And it was just this bipartisan triumph for women, not to mention a freshman lawmaker. Um, so pretty amazing. She also um, helped secure funds, by the way, Vicki, for the first purpose-built Washington State Library, working with her former uh, roommate during the legislature and the first woman to be elected to Congress from Washington State, and that was Catherine May of, uh, of Yakima. Julie was also in later years a trustee of the Washington State Supreme, or rather of the Washington State Historical Society. This is a picture of Julia posing for uh, the photographer from, from the Seattle Times. Picture appeared on the front page of the Times, front and center, three columns wide in 1949 on the day that she was named chairman, the first female chairman of the Washington State House of Representatives County uh, Committee on Roads and Bridges. It was an amazing breakthrough for a woman. Here's Julia and Secretary of State Vic Myers discussing highway issues in 1958 after Julia had become one of the most influential highway planners in the United States. Um, Julia, in, in speaking of bipartisanship, um, 
When Dwight Eisenhower was elected president of the United States, um, one of his first initiatives was to draw on something that he had learned as a young tank commander during World War I, and then as the Supreme Allied Commander of Allied Forces in Europe during World War II, as the Allies pressed into Nazi German, Germany using Hitler's vaunted Autobahn. And, um, Eisenhower knew, knew firsthand from making a cross-country jaunt in 1917 that America's roads were abysmal, and even in the post-war era, talk about infrastructure. So the Eisenhower initiative, bipartisan initiative to build interstate highways was something that Julia uh, was really had a front row seat for. Uh, not only as um, highways committee chairman in the legislature for both the the interim committee and the standing committees, but she was enormously influential in proposing uh, highways and bridges, standardizing uh, safety uh, measures, everything from licensing to to the the shapes of of highway signs. Uh, pretty remarkable. There's a chapter in the book that the Seattle Times excerpted. Uh, a few months back that, that documented a fascinating scheme that Julia Butler Hansen, uh, Governor Rosalini, and a young civil engineer named Dan Evans, who went on to be a three-term governor, um, promoted to make a floating bridge connecting um, the the mainland in uh, off of Seattle at Southward, or rather, um, Fauntleroy, the Fauntleroy neighborhood over to the islands to expedite um, uh, travel. Here, this is a, a fascinating thing. This is the Washington legislature's joint fact-finding committees on highway streets and bridges in 1959. Uh, the, the short gentleman uh, with the, the dapper mustache right behind him is young Dan Evans. And I'll tell a story in a minute about how Dan Evans came to be on that committee. But this is, you'll notice that there's a, a platoon of men and the chairman of this committee is Julia Butler Hansen. Not only was she the first female chairman of the Roads and Bridges Committee in the Washington House, she was the first female chairman of the 11 Interstate Western Interstate Highways Committee during the uh, the building of the interstate highways. The uh, it would it would have been fascinating to think of what might have happened had floating bridges connected the uh, uh, Seattle area to Bainbridge and and all throughout the, the Puget Sound. It's a fascinating thing. Uh, here's a Julian State Librarian Marion Reynolds uh, seated next to Julia, and they're wearing the obligatory corsages for that event and Governor uh, Rosalini is signing uh, her bill to build the first ever purpose-built Washington State Library in 1957. Mary Ann Reynolds, our state librarian, uh, was the real spark plug behind that. Uh, heretofore, the Washington State Library had been sort of in the basement at the Temple of Justice and Mary Ann with her just was indefatigable in pushing for a purpose-built building in between Julia and Catherine May, who deserved to be in that photo of well, uh, as well, uh, they, they got it done in 1957. Uh, on the campaign trail you know, with Julia in 1972, her sister-in-law had a really wonderful quote about what it was like. She said she would drive 100 miles to meet with a dozen people, and there were no freeways then, She'd see a farmer out in his field. She'd stop the car, pull on some overshoes and climb right through a barbed wire fence or blackberry vines. When she'd come back and we'd worry about the scratches all over, she'd say, it'll heal. She'd wipe off the blood and the mud and say, he's an old friend or he's got problems I should know about. This picture um, here is, is one of uh, the best I ever took as a, a a news photographer. It shows Julia greeting a constituent at the dedication of fish protein concentration plant in it that was being built in Aberdeen in 1971. And Julia with her arts outstretched hands there and her, her thousand watt smile really personifies the politician she was. 
the um, I was that's probably the best candid photo of a politician I ever took. And I was really thrilled that the Library of Congress called and asked if they could have a print of it and said that they wanted to use it in a book they were publishing about women members of Congress. So I got twenty five dollars for that, too. So that was. Columnists and editorial writers back in the day uh, just delighted in Julia, and they they had all these titles that they made up for her. They called her the Duchess of Cathlamet, the Sage of Wakayakum County, the Little Old Lady in Logging Boots, Mrs. Highways, and sometimes behind her back, and if they could get away with it to her face, they would call her Madam Queen. That's That's the kind of personality she had. She could, she smoked like a chimney, she could cuss like a logger, and she always described herself, though, as a complicated daydreamer. She was born in 1907 and was absolutely steeped in the pioneer lore. The, uh, she was the first woman to serve on the Cathlamet Town Council. Oh, here, by the way, we've got to pause for this. Here's Julia her mother to the right, Maud Kimball Butler, and her, her grandmother. And the, the, three, um, the three women there were practically doppelgangers. They looked so much alike, especially Julia, when, as she grew older, looking like a combination of her, her grandmother and her mother, Julia Ann Blood Kimball, who was a, a pioneer woman, came west with her logging superintendent, husband in the 1870s and was an absolute force of nature. Mrs. Kimball lived with the family after her husband died. And then there were just the, the, the three women and the two boys after Julia's uh, father, uh, the Wakayakum County Sheriff, uh, died uh, in, uh, when she was only about 11 years old. So the, the this was a household where Julia grew up around really strong old women who were absolutely in the trenches in 1910 when the women of Washington pushed through suffrage a decade ahead of the 19th Amendment. And it just galled the rods out of her grandmother in the 1870s when the between the legislature and the courts women in Washington got the vote and then lost it and then the guys had taken it away and and Julia Ann Kimball said that um, it, it, here she was an educated woman and couldn't vote and that she would walk down Main Street in Cathlamet and the, the Pauls would be uh, plying potential voters uh, by liquoring them up before they they went off to vote dutifully for whoever had bought them the last round. And, and that was just so frustrating. And then in 1903, uh, at the age of 23, Maud Kim Butler, Julia's mom, was elected uh, superintendent of schools in Wakayakum County. And gallingly, she couldn't even vote for herself. So all these things, these antecedents for Julia, were really um, made her the kind of person she was, this, this forceful, outspoken in force of nature, such an overused phrase, but she really was. She was the first woman to serve on the Cathlamet Town Council, the first woman to head the Education and Roads and Bridges Committees in the State House of Representatives. She, her dream was to be a, a journalist, but when she attended the University of Washington and Oregon State University, she had concluded that um, if she was a, in, the, in that area in, in newspapering, she'd end up just writing society stories, weddings and engagements and, and that sort of thing. And she didn't want to do that. We'll flash back here. Thanks, Erin, for giving us these wonderful photos. In 1923, if you'll go back to that one, Erin, of Julia at Buckley High School, uh, in 1923, Julia's mom um, got a job as the first female pres uh, principal at the Wickersham Elementary School in Buckley. And that was a real opportunity because Buckley was a lot bigger town, uh, had a, a, an accredited high school. And Julia's mom had fought a running battle with a school board in, in Wakayakum County over 
uh, not investing enough money in schools. So Julia's mom took this opportunity, jumped at it, and Julia just reveled in being able to go to a larger high school. She um, was a uh, correspondent for the Tacoma Ledger. Uh, she edited the yearbook. She was active in athletics and was just an all-around um, vivacious girl. But on to the University of Washington and bouncing back and forth between what was the, the forerunner of Oregon State University. She lived at the Daughters of the American Revolution House at the University of Washington, uh, something her mother and her grandmother were passionate about. Um, and as a, a student activist, um, in the beginning of the New Deal, she got very, very involved in Young Democrats. Uh, she met Warren Magnuson. She began corresponding with, with members of Roosevelt's cabinet, including the first female cabinet member, Secretary of Labor, Frances Perkins. And she did all these moxie things for a young woman um, out of the University of Washington with a degree in home economics. She decided to start a tea room in Bellingham. But Julia wrote in her diary that the, her timing could have been worse in the middle of the Great Depression. And she ended up giving away most of the food to, to homeless, hungry people who appeared at the, at the front door, at the back door every night looking for scraps. So. The tea room closes. She comes home to Calf Lamet, where her mom's moved back for another term as school superintendent. Um, and she starts writing a book about um, two children who are making a trip across the, the, the Great Plains on the Oregon Trail to, uh, to Calf Lamet in, in the 1870s. And it, uh, it, it really, um, doing that, in that historical research uh, gave her something really important to do besides this work with the, uh, the young Democrats. Then when the opportunity arose to the open seat on the Calf Lamette Town Council, she jumped at that. Um, and immediately with that 50-50 act that we mentioned earlier, started to make her, uh, her mark in the legislature. Here's Julia taking her seat for the first time uh, in 1939 as a freshman. The, um, when she got up to make her first speech, had the temerity to make a, a pretty sizable speech as a freshman legislature, legislator, one of the male legislators buttonholed her afterwards and criticized her and said that she ought to have more decorum and that she was only a woman and besides she wasn't from King County. And uh, Julia, according to legend, which uh, I, I've heard so many times it has to be true, that uh, Julia <laughs> told the guy that to take off his glasses and he looked at her kind of quizzically and she said, you'd better take off your glasses because I'm going to hit you. And she, she, according to bystander, bystander, she decked the guy. And it wasn't the, the first time uh, according to, to a lot of sources, that she slapped an impertinent man or thumped a guy in the chest. And at this time, one of the things that, that Julia was really sensitive about was her weight. Her mother and her grandmother were both stocky women. Um, she had a sweet tooth. She was a great cook. And so after the birth of um, her son, David, in 1946, she went on a crash course diet, lost about 100 pounds and became uh, a dramatically more handsome woman. Uh, as we'll see later in some of these photos, she was just a striking, striking person. Uh, and she took great pride in that. Here's Julie in the interim, uh, 1949, she's still losing weight. and. And here she is. I love these these journalistic pictures of having somebody pose with a map and a pencil that the uh, pretty candid stuff. The um, in the 1940s, before she uh, won her first committee chairmanships, Julie was already the leader of what they called the country mice, as opposed to the 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 gang in King County that 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 wielded uh, great power. And the only way the rural legislators then as today could really have any any uh, say was to to be very close knit in it and it crossed party lines. It, it, the Republican rural legislators in that era 
um, joined forces. But Julia, um, there was another faction there in the 1930s that I'm sure many of you listening today know about, and that was the a very, very sizable left wing uh, contingent from King County. It was FDR's postmaster general who quipped on, on arriving in Washington that he was visiting, that there were 47 states in the Soviet of Washington. And Ju Julia was uh, a staunchly conservative um, as opposed to the left wingers in King County. And so she allied with Republican and, uh, and conservative Democrats in Southwest Washington and from Eastern Washington and developed some real coalitions. She was very nearly elected Speaker of the House in the mid 1940s after a f only a few years in the, in the legislature. I really love this photo that, that uh, Aaron's just shared with us of Julia posing at the historic site sign outside the Wakayakum, Wakayakum County Courthouse in 1960. The, um, in 1955, Julia had one of the most galling defeats, a rare defeat in her career. She, uh, some say that she lost by one vote. I couldn't confirm that, but I could confirm that it was a very, very narrow loss when she made her bid to become the first female speaker of the Washington State House of Representatives. Um, the irony was that her good friend, John O'Brien from King County, a classic South Seattle Irishman, uh, defeated her. There was no hard feelings between John and Julia, but uh, John's henchmen were the ones who really were subjected to her ire, especially the legendary August P. Martisich from Everett, who was sort of the leader of the uh, anti-Julia coalition in the legislature. Uh, Augie Martisich, whom I knew well, was, a, was an amazing character. He used to smoke his cigarettes Bogart style with, between his thumb and his index finger. And to really, uh, in his power struggles with Julia, Julia, he knew the way to really get under her skin was to call her honey, which she absolutely hated. But after she lost the, uh, the speakership, uh, the guys were sort of hedging their bets and, and sheepishly approached her, including Martisich. And Martisich held out his hand and said, no hard feelings, Julie, okay? And she looked and she smiled and says, no hard feelings, but I'll get even with you sons of bitches. And she, and she did. <laughs> she did. It would be 65 years, by the way, before a woman, Lori Jenkins, was elected Speaker of the Washington House. And I need to make certain that Speaker Jenkins gets a copy of Julia Butler Hanson so she can learn about the struggle that, that, that occurred for a woman to make that breakthrough. Well, here's Julia Butler Hanson with three of her best and oldest friends, Warren G. Magnuson and Henry M. Scoop Jackson. And the, the, one of the most amazing stories in this book is that in 1957, Scoop, Maggie, and John F. Kennedy, together with the Speaker of the House, Sam Reburn, drove to Kath Lamott to try to convince Julia to run for Congress. The, the third district seat in Congress had been held by a Republican, Russell Mack of Hoquiam, whom I also knew well, uh, since the 1940s. And they figured with all of her moxie, Julia was the only one who could reclaim that seat. She, in fact, announced for Congress in 1958 to take, to take on Mac, but her mother, um, who, whom she adored, uh, had a, a heart attack in the middle of that campaign, and Julia withdrew. Fate would occur that she would be elected to Congress and reclaim the seat, but it wouldn't be against Russell Mac, whom she... In a, in a lot of ways, admired. He was a he was a, a, a Republican who knew how to walk the tightrope in the third congressional district with all those blue collar Democrats. So he delivered on forest issues and dredging issues and the like, and was a very formidable uh, uh, person in his own right. Russell V. Mack died on the floor of of Congress in 1960. Um, he was standing in the well of Congress talking to, to, to several colleagues and one said to him, it's a lovely day, isn't it, Russell? And Max said, not for me, it isn't. 
and he, he turned white as a ghost, collapsed, fell backward, hit his head, and was pronounced um, dead on the spot. This opened uh, the floodgates. Uh, a host of Democrats and Republicans tossed their hats in the ring. The, the, the day after Russell Mack died, uh, the media descended on Julia and wanted to know if she was going to run, and she said something very decorous and very smart. She said, can't we let the gentleman rest in peace for at least a couple of weeks before we get about with this unseemly business of trying to reclaim his seat? And that that impressed a lot of Republicans, too. She she was so cagey about um, about she had this combination of political moxie and old old school manners that really served her well. So the, um, the the first Republican or first woman elected to Congress of Washington State, as I said earlier, was Catherine May, Julia's friend. Um, and they had lived together, by the way, uh, for a couple of sessions while they served in the legislature together. And I can only imagine that those must have been some fascinating conversations because Catherine was a uh, uh, a pretty conservative Republican, and Julia um, was still a New Dealer, but they they were great chums. And and when Julia arrived on Capitol Hill in 1960 after winning that election, um, Catherine May and uh, Margaret Chase Smith of Maine were through a reception, which which speaks volumes about the what a, a confraternity of those handful of women women in the United States Congress represented in that day. Um, the Here's a copy of Julius signing a copy of her children's book, Singing Paddles for Carolyn Kennedy, after she visited Kennedy in the Oval Office for the first time in 1961. And Jacqueline Kennedy left just sent Julia this lovely extended note saying how much she appreciated that. It was, uh, it gave us some real insight into Jacqueline Kennedy and her attention to detail. The um, Julia um, deeply admired John F. Kennedy um, and had been mildly impressed when he arrived to, to suggest she run for Congress. But she was really offended by the way the Kennedy people treated Vice President Johnson. Here's the, the former master of the Senate, as Robert Carroll was documented in his magisterial series of biographies of Lyndon Johnson, reduced to being sort of uh, an afterthought as vice president. And the Kennedy people called him Uncle Corn Pone, and Lady Bird was his little pork chop. Uh, Carroll uh, has a, a fabulous chapter about that. Uh, Julia, uh, that offended every sensibility about Julia. So she made it a point to call on the vice president. And when he uh, was getting set to take Air Force Two off to Eastern Washington to dedicate a dam, the first person he called to ask if she wanted to ride in a jet airplane was Julia Butler Hansen. And from that time on, they were uh, peas in a pod. Uh, they were, this picture tells you everything you need to know about Lyndon Johnson and his friendship with Julia Butler Hansen. That's not just some idle pose. They were real pals. And there's a wonderful piece of video that shows Lyndon Johnson with his toddler grandson, Lynn, in his arms in a reception room. And when he spots Julia, he just makes his beeline across the room, uh, forks over the kid to Julia, and it, it's, it's really wonderful. When LBJ uh, became president, Julia was a frequent visitor to the White House and a staunch ally, although they parted company uh, later on about the war in Vietnam. Uh, Julia thought in retrospect that the Gulf of Tonkin resolution that gave LBJ such wide leeway to escalate that war was a huge mistake. The, uh, by 1967, Julia was arguably the most powerful woman in the United States Congress because through the uh, a couple of strategic losses by Democratic colleagues and some moxie on her part, she got herself named as chairman of the Subcommittee on Interior Appropriations. 
And what that amounted to is control over the billion dollar budgets for the United States Forest Service, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the National Park Service, the Bureau of Land Management, Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Geological Survey, the Bureau of Mines, the Smithsonian Institution, the National Foundation for Arts and Humanities. That was for a Northwest Congress member of Congress. That was just uh, uh, the plum of all plums. And better yet, Henry M. Jackson was uh, was chaired the Senate Interior Committee. So they, they just became this incredible tag team. There's a really great story about um, about former Alaska Governor Walter Hickel, who has was named by Nixon in 1968 after the election to be the next Secretary of the Interior. And reporters uh, waylaid Hickel at SeaTac Airport on his way to Washington D.C. and asked him. Well, what do you think about Julia Butler Hansen and as subcommittee chairman? And he looked up and he said famously, Julia who? And the, the Los Angeles Times wrote an editorial the next day that said that was probably the, the faux pas of the, of, the, of the century because anyone who was, quote, anyone who, everyone who was anyone in Washington, D.C. knew who Julia Butler Hansen was. She was a master of the parliamentary process. Uh, fascinating thing was that Walter Hickel, who had sort of a checkered record on the environment, and Julia was a, a strong environmentalist, um, came around and made some very interesting uh, progressive decisions about the Trans-Alaska oil pipeline and offshore oil drilling. And um, he and Julia became real friends. It was, uh, and she deeply regretted when uh, Nixon fired Hickel uh, for being too blunt in his criticism of uh, the Vietnam policies. The, um, so how did Julia manage to do all this? Uh, the, I take it right back to those, to the grandmother and mother um, in the way she learned history. Uh, what better way to learn history and to be seeped in history in a place like Calf Lamet uh, along the Columbia than with a pioneer grandmother and in all this uh, amazing collection of people who arrived on the river boats when delivering mail and cargo, visiting politicians. Uh, she just, Julia, the, 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 her house had hundreds of books. There was poetry and, and all sorts of biographies from the, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire to the Durant's great histories. And she just absorbed all that. And she always said that one of the, the best perks about being elected to Congress was having full access to the Library of Congress. She absolutely loved it. In 1934, as I mentioned earlier, um, after the tea room closed, she wrote this book about a Kentucky family traversing the Oregon Trail to Kathlamet. And it, it, the book was a turning point in her life. The book was called Singing Paddles. And in 1935, it received the equivalent of a Caldecott Medal. It was then called the Julia Ellsworth Ford Foundation. Pick Singing Paddles is one of 1935's top six works of juvenile fiction. Now, Julia, get this one, $200. That's about $3,500 today. And in something she absolutely counted as priceless, standing as a professional writer. By 1940, 15,000 copies of single singing paddles had been sold. And the celebrity that, Ju that Julie acquired, excuse me, as a prize winning author, really advanced her budding interest in a political career. Reviewers for the New York Times, the Christian Science Monitor, and the LA Times praised the book's pace and authenticity, saying that the child protagonists of Singing Paddles got to know more about the geography of their country than the textbooks that have, have ever told. And, and reading uh, one of my prized possessions is an autographed copy from Julia of Singing Paddles. Um, she, she really was an outstanding writer. Um, but 
I, I fear that for a modern eight eight year old enamored of Spider Man and the Hulk, that they if you handed them a copy of Singing Paddles, they'd reach for the Xbox after about three pages. And some of the uh, the dialogue is really pretty stilted. Um, the the pioneers called the engines engines, and uh, I checked in some of those pioneer diaries, and they really did call the engines Indians engines. But it really comes across as cowboys and Indian stuff. And uh, it was it's kind of a, a misnomer um, to think of the book as having racist, racist overtones today and dialogue. Because Julie had grown her up around Native Americans in Wakayakum County and hugely admired their traditions. She always the first thing she put on when she got home from from work was her moccasins, beaded moccasins. And when she became chairman of the Interior Appropriations Committee, the BIA, reforming the BIA and advancing self-determination for Native Americans was really high on her agenda. When she retired from Congress in 1975, the National Congress of American Indians hailed her as a true tr champion of tribal self-determination. Excuse me, folks, I have a real frog in my throat here. You know, I, I think if Julie were still alive, she would really share my admiration for Cassandra Tate's brilliant new book about the Whitman massacre called Unsettled Ground. The truth about the mission, the truth about the missionaries, often contentious and sensitive interaction with the natives and the whole racist thrust of Manifest Destiny really snap into focus in Cassandra's book. Uh, and I really recommend that to the to King County readers, Unsettled Ground, I, I think, is one of the most important Northwest history books in decades. Well, Julia's um, track record in equal rights uh, is really personified by this picture. Here she uh, is, is the veteran congresswoman with uh, younger congresswomen, including Char Charlotte Reed and Margaret Griffiths in the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment. Julia always said that a woman had to work twice as hard as a man to get accepted. You can't be an incompetent woman, she said. If you are, the men will laugh you right down the drain. And early on, when she emerged as a power on the Kathleen Town Council, she was disturbed to discover that, quote, women have a fatalistic capacity of being extremely jealous of other women. My wife and my daughters tell me that they've seen that, too. Here's a really fabulous picture. The, and I just love the girls. These are the girls at Girls Nation in about 1962, and they're escorting Julia to the podium of Girls Nation. I, I love the way they're dressed and, the, and Julia's beaming. She, she just loved going to Girls Nation because she, she had such faith in young women as, the, as being moving into major roles in politics in all professions in America. On the whole, Julia said, most women were sick of being a bug on the end of a pin, worry of the notion that we should be something completely and startlingly different because we're women. We're not. We're citizens. But don't try to get elected and just say, well, I'm a woman. Vote for me because I'm a woman. I have a special kind of intuition or this or that or something else. That's really stupid. Dan Evans, the uh, Washington's three-term governor, and former U.S. Senator discovered Julia was really someone special about the time of this picture. This is uh, he, in 1957, when he was a freshman in the House of Representatives, he was surprised and thrilled to be asked to serve on this committee, the Joint Fact-Finding Committee on Highway Streets and Bridges. It was a real plum assignment. I was a civil engineer and Julia wanted someone with, someone with expertise, he said. But I was a Republican and it was a Republican and it was a Republican slot. And the Republican leader protested that a prestigious seat like that should not go to a freshman. Appoint him, Julia said. And he and, she, and he did. There was no arguing with Julia, Evans said. I quickly developed enormous respect for this savvy, disarmingly plain spoken woman who was an expert on highway legislation. During his, her 11 years as chairman of legislative highway committees, Julie helped plan the state's network of modern roads, highways, and bridges, 
And as governor, two decades later, Dan Evans repaid the favor by appointing Julia to the State Highway Commission and Toll Bridge Authority. This is a picture of the last meeting <coughs> with the inimitable Dixie the Ray as governor. Julia never said a bad word about Dixie the Ray, though she was very disappointed in her performance as governor, the first woman and a Democrat to boot. And um, I asked Julia several times when Dixie Ray had picked a fight with Senator Magnuson, Magnuson over oil tankers in Puget Sound, what she thought of Governor Ray. I mean, she, no comment, no comment. But one day when Julia was visiting the Port of Grace Harbor, I heard, overheard a conversation between Julia and the port director, a guy named Hank Soike, who was a great friend of, of both Julia and Senator Magnuson. And, uh, and Soiki shook his head and, head and said, go figure, why is she doing this? And Julia said, she's an amateur. I thought that was a wonderful quote. I respected Julia too much to, to print something that I'd overheard like that, but it was, uh, I certainly could include it in the book. Well, what most people didn't know about Julia, by the way, here's Julia with her blacksmith husband, Henry and David Hansen in 1948, the uh, Henry Hansen was uh, uh, was about, I think, 30 years it was older than Julia. Uh, but it was they had a wonderful relationship. They loved poetry. Here was this big, strong, callous handed, strong logging company blacksmith. And they they loved to garden together and bake and, and read poetry. So it was it was. Uh, it was Julia's side as a sensitive romantic. She was she was really happiest reading a storybook to a child or uh, tend, uh, tending to her immaculate English garden with its boxwood hedges and rose bushes. And she was also, some will find this ironic, a prayerful Christian scientist, a strong disciple of Mary Baker Eddy. And her son, David, however, who is a very observant scientist says, yeah, well, except you're not supposed to smoke, drink, or cuss. And that was mom. There's that dichotomy of Julia, uh, on the one hand, in the middle of a, a really tense congressional session, <clears throat> calling in a, a Christian science reader to do some work, as she put it. They'd pray and read and read Mary Baker editor, Eddie, and then she'd get revived. And at the same time, after she'd had a prayer session, she'd decamp to the fabled Monocle restaurant on Capitol Hill and th have three martinis. Uh, David Hansen did history this remarkable favor. He not only kept this voluminous archive of his mother's papers, including her diaries and his her grandmother's his his grandmother's diaries, but he shared them with me without reservation. And they are some of the most sensitive, intimate, illuminating, amazing things I've ever read as a historian. David, uh, had, David readily admits there were times growing up when he was absolutely terrified of his mother. He said, mother had high expectations and low patience. She was a combination of General Patton and John Wayne, and her tongue lashings were worse than her spankings. When he was around six, David said that he balked at a bowl of cold cereal that, that, that Julia placed in, for, in front of him before school. And then uh, when he complained, his mother picked up the bowl and lobbed it at him. And David says, I ducked it, it hit the floor, and they both laughed. The, <laughs> the, these, these diaries, I'll have to tell you, friends, are um, absolutely remarkable. Julia's mother gave uh, her this diary in uh, when her sophomore year at Buckley High School, and it absolutely kindled this zeal for her to be a writer. And it, they're just a movable feast. And then when I was able to compare Mrs. Butler, her mother's own contemporary and contemporaneous entries with Julia's, this remarkable story of these two women uh, really emerged. Um, Julia told her diary she was sometimes filled with a feeling of accomplishment, yet, quote, never in the measure I wanted, 
because I was a woman and because I was raised in a town beside a river in a family that spoke of Victorian language and valued learning. One day after she was tidying up her desk and cleaning the refrigerator, she had a, a compulsion to get busy writing again. This is in the 1950s. She said, should she tell her story like a novel or a memoir? Maybe I can piece it all together. It might make possible some other girl's success for I didn't come from wealth or guaranteed place. I was just plain me. I was just plain me. What a remarkable thing for an extraordinary woman who rose from the Kathlamet Town Council to be the chairman of the most powerful Congressional Appropriations Committee in its era. In the entry for January 17, 1926, is one of the most revealing and lyrical passages that Julia wrote during her conflicted college days uh, when she was living at the DAR house. This is, this is amazing. Just between you and me, diary, I do wish some of the boys on this campus would call me up once in a while. Also, since this is just for us, I wish I liked this house better and I wish I could write for publication. I just love to write stories and yet I'm scared. Shall I say that diary? Do, it, do I really sit down and plot out and write a whole story? Oh, I do wish I were a better Christian scientist, but I guess we all start humbly and our maker really will secure, rather rescue us, perfect or not, and help us for he's a loving father. Now diary, this is just for us. When I'm reading this stuff, it was just amazing. I felt I was just transported. Sometimes I do like to write down what's at the very bottom of my heart. It helps heaps. Someday I hope I might travel. Oh, the magic of the Orient, the lure of East Indochina, Singapore in a green jaded light as its mystic evening sets in, its atmosphere oriental, ancient, cruel. It almost enshrouds me. I see the sensual full-lipped women slinking low in the dives of sailors, a Carmen in her dark glory. Then on to Russia, a peasant throng, the mounted Cossacks, the terror of the northern steppes, fly by on steeds as fiery as their vodka and their scary linen for all the modernism he has displaced. Back again, I'd come to my land of the free, my little world in Kathlamet, my dream fulfilled, a life more rich. Oh, the magic and travel, if I could do it someday. This is just for us, diary, and only because I feel like writing something beautiful. I could have written a whole chapter about Julia's love of poetry. The first time I visited the Hanson house in years since visiting Julia there in the 1970s, I pulled a volume of Walt Whitman poems off Julia's bookshelf and one page was one of the greatest poems ever written. It's one of my favorites too as an English major. When lilacs last and the dooryard bloomed and the great star early drooped in the western sky in the night, I mourn and yet shall mourn with ever returning spring. Wow, that was, that was an electric moment. And listen to what Julia wrote herself in 1939 when she was falling in love with Henry Hansen. He's 24 years, there it is, he's 24 years her senior. He's a, he barely has a high school education, yet he, he just, he loves learning. Emily Dixon, Dickinson would have been proud to have written this stanza, slim fingers of a finer craftsman than I drew the lines of a woman's life and designed her way with cunning eyes. That's really good poetry, friends. Julie always credited her, for her feminist mother as inspiration for all this. Um, Maud Kimball Butler, uh, the, who, by the way, was Washington's uh, mother of the year in 1960 after Julia was elected to Congress and made all the pages. She was this amazing person, uh, a, a gifted watercolorist. Uh, the Washington State Historical Society has published a, a volume of just her historic watercolors of, of pioneer life in Kathlamet. She was a diarist, uh, became um, a deputy uh, to the superintendent of public instruction, uh, enthusiastic member of the Daughters of the American Revolution, a founding member of the League of Women Voters. Julia wrote, she was the most tolerant, adventurous, and happy human being I've ever known. In, 
Maud's own diary, which I could compare these notes uh, during the 1941 legislative session, Julia was completely flabbergasted by the machinations of male politicians and wrote, I feel it's very rare that I feel so utterly disgusted as I do tonight, hopelessly disgusted that I want to perpetrate words of condemnation, words I'll probably regret, but I do tonight. Having just come back from rules earlier in the day and from a democratic caucus, what pitifully small mortals we are, how trivial the ends of man. Democracy itself has been handicapped by the traitors in our leadership who use the office as a personal throne for obtaining gains that in a large scale of life and eternity are infinitesimal. Tonight, I have seen unmasked the Speaker of the House, a traitor, a sellout, petty, greedy, bully of body, small of soul and mind. God damn the male and God help the people trusting them who won't elect a honest woman. To me, there is just plain unhappiness in being here. I, I hate it and I shall never, ever come again. Well, she changed her mind the next week. <laughs> The uh, and Maud's own diary entry said talked about how P.O. Julia was, and at the end she said, "Very queer girl is Julia." <laughs> I just love that. And there's Julia as the witness to history too. When President Roosevelt, whom she met on two occasions, died of a cerebral hemorrhage at 63 in 1945, Julia Julia's eulogy in her Julia. Is, is really moving. I think I've cried all the tears possible for a human being. I cast my first presidential vote for him in 1932. Memory takes me back to those fall days when I was learning politics and walked the lanes and byways asking voters to pledge themselves to FDR. In that long gone fall, I can still see the dismay, the fear, the stark, bitter unbelief, hungry, weary people despairing for the future of America how eager they were to vote. Rain pelted down that first election day and all day we paddled through it throughout the district from Aberdeen to Vancouver, delivering our voters to the polls. Down the years he marched with us, his gallantry inspiring ours. It seems scarcely fitting to mention that damn 1940 legislature now or mark down all the seeming failure of Governor Walgren to do much but talk about whiskey and tourists to me, it was astonishing to meet a man who had been 12 years in Congress and who could know so little about everything. I trust Truman knows more. God help us all. Governor Walgren, by the way, made a big mistake. He vetoed Julia's bill to grant Washington's teachers more contractual protections, raises, and pension benefits. And when he did it, Julia denounced him, pillar to post, and he tried to have his goons read her out of the, her roles as, as Democrat, Democratic uh, caucus chairman in both Wakayakum and Cowlitz counties. Julia redoubled her efforts, rallied all those rural Democrats, uh, got a big war chest, helped defeat Walgren in the next election by a Republican, and got herself reelected. And that was the last of Mon Walgren as governor. You know, Julia was such an avid feminist, but I loved her diary entries about the time of the ERA when she was worried that some of the young women in the women's liberation movement would do, quote, will do well to shave their legs and not burn their bras. I love that. If it's sexism, just absolutely outraged her. In 1964, her Republican friend, Margaret Chase Smith of Maine, challenged Barry Goldwater for the GOP presidential nomination and received 27 first ballot votes. Asked if she would consider second place on the ticket, Margaret Chase Smith said, I am thinking only of the presidency. It is time. Little wonder that Margaret Chase Smith and Julia Butler Hansen became such friends. Smith was one of the most admired women in America, according to Gallup polls, yet her age, like Julia's, was the inevitable identifier in press coverage of her campaign. In No Stopping Us Now, a really compelling book about older women in American history by New York Times columnist Gail Collins, Collins writes, the media seemed incapable of discussing Smith's campaign without describing her as silver haired, the same adjective they used for Julia. Uh, 
She complained that almost every news story starts with a 66-year-old senator. I haven't seen the age played up in the case of men candidates, Margaret Chase Smith said, and so did Julia. By then, Julia had endured about 20 years of age talk. Her hair was beginning to gray even before she gave birth to David in 1946, and she was disinclined to dye it, quipping that she earned those silver hairs dealing with dim bulb men. And well, she wrote marvelous physical descriptions of people of male, female, of all ages, and animated her work a writer, as a writer, but she resented the sexist shorthand journalists employed when writing about female politicians. Invariably, she was characterized as being white-haired, code for menopausal, or sharp-tongued. Women were supposed to be like children seen, not heard, I guess. Granted, they often couch her combative personalities as admirable as being able to hold her own with the guys, but that was part of the persona she cultivated to get ahead in the man's world. Uh, in, uh, she had saved the clipping I'd found of a 1966 AP article on U.S. women elected to major offices, and it described Hawaii Congressman Patsy Mink as the slow-eyed glamour girl of the House, and Alabama's Governor-elect Lorreen Wallace as the blonde 40-year-old mother of four. Julia said that reporters should start describing all the, over all the overweight men with thinning hair. I love that. After retiring from the Transportation Commission in 1981, Julia stayed active in politics for a few more years. Here's Julia with her granddaughter and namesake, Julia Ann in the garden in 1982. But cancer linked to her decades of smoking finally caught up with her. She died in the spring of 1988, almost 81. In a sense, she had written, almost written her own eulogy six years earlier. She was cleaning out a desk drawer two months after her husband's death, and she discovered, rediscovered her journal that she hadn't kept up. Off and on since girlhood, she had confided her most innermost thoughts, hopes, dreams to her journals. And she thought, hmm, should I keep this for posterity or burn it? Here's what she wrote. I'm not sure about burning, yet that's probably the most sensible thing to do unless I preface this book with this. Only read it if you have an understanding heart, for this is the record of a passionate heart, a woman with a temper, sensitive to hurt and pain, a tumultuous soul. It is a story of weakness and strength, the pain and joy and love. My public goal was to serve the people I represented as lovingly and consistently and capably as possible. Senator Magnuson, her friends since their days together in the 1930s, summed up her half century in public service with this quote, no one ever represented her people better than Julia Butler Hansen. By the way, I, I should have mentioned earlier that Julia Butler Hansen was in some respects a terrible boss. As one of her aides put it, she was, she was mercurial as hell, um, worked long hours, uh, and you weren't supposed to go home until the boss went home. And if the boss went to lunch, she wanted uh, young aides in particular. W one told me that I felt sort of like in accompanying her that I was the sword at her side, that she wanted to show that she had this entourage. Um, once um, she, she, she had a, uh, a penchant for uh, not being able to say I'm sorry very well. And she'd make up for it with little small gestures a few days later, like um, a gift of a book, um, um, a bouquet of roses. But one of her, her young aides was so frustrated by trying to keep up with Julia that she faked a pregnancy so that she, she could get out of her job and go back to Seattle. And I, and I thought that was uh, spoke volumes about Julia. Well, I have um, rambled too much about this inimitable character. And uh, if you'd like to, to read this book, it's, uh, it's available online. It is, you can check it out from your fine libraries. It soon will be in every library in the state, um, but it's also available for purchase online at the Secretary of State's um, 
website that you see there, we deliberately kept this the price of this beautiful book low during this pandemic, um, not knowing how much it would sell, but wanting to get it out to as many people as possible. So the book is $20, um, I think it's $23.40, plus shipping and handling, and then the applicable taxes. But I will tell you, I've I, this is my 12th book, and I've never been prouder of, of the presentation in the book. Amber Rainey just did a masterful job. Um, it's, the, it's, it's beautifully printed, and uh, I'm very proud of it. I'd love to answer your questions.